Pediatric Burns, written and presented by Jean Mers from Shriners Hospitals for Children, Cincinnati, Ohio. This program is about pediatric burns and some of the differences in caring for children with burns as opposed to adults with burns. By the end of the program, the learner will be able to describe and discuss the following for a pediatric burn patient. The primary assessment, the secondary assessment, including the calculation of total body surface area burned, the principles of fluid resuscitation, principles of pain management, and nutrition in a burned child. One of the biggest differences between a child and adult is their body surface area. Infants up to one year of age and children up to 15 years of age have a greater surface area per unit of body weight than do adults. This results in greater contact with the environment and therefore a greater evaporative loss of water per unit of body weight than do adults. This is particularly significant in a pediatric burn as massive amounts of fluid can be lost through evaporation. Therefore, infants and children need more fluid per unit of body weight during resuscitation than do adults. Another big difference between the child and adult is the ability to regulate their body temperature. First, in the infant and child, temperature regulation is influenced by the child's relatively greater body surface area, so body heat is rapidly lost. While adults can generate heat by shivering, the child cannot do it as well due to his relatively small muscle mass. Also, temperature regulation in infants under six months of age depends less on shivering and more on intrinsic metabolic processes in the environmental temperature. Assessment of the child begins with the primary assessment. You will begin your assessment with the classic airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure of, in the event. When assessing the airway, an important consideration is whether the child has an inhalation injury. So the first, to determine this, you will look for several things. The first is where was the child found, inside or outside in a closed area or not? Upon physical exam, do you also find facial burns, singed nasal hairs, edema of the nose and the mouth, carbonaceous sputum, hoarseness, strider, dyspnea, wheezing, or decreased mentation from hypoxia? The treatment for all of this would be to administer 100% oxygen per rebreather mask. But remember, a child's airway is smaller than an adult's with the narrowest point at the cricoid, not the glottis. So any edema can lead to an airway obstruction quicker. A child shows subtle signs of impending obstruction, and these include things like hoarseness, increased work of breathing, tachypnea and retractions due to increased pliability of the child's rib cage. This increased pliability leads to increased work against the constriction from a circumferential chest burn, so a child may need a chest escherotomy earlier than an adult. This slide shows the effects of edema on airway resistance in the adult versus the infant. With one millimeter of edema in the airway, the child's resistance increases 16 times, and the diameter of his airway increases 75% versus the adult airway, which starts out at eight millimeters. One millimeter of edema will only increase resistance three times and they decrease the diameter 44%. Because of these effects, a child with a facial burn can be quite scary and many providers think of only one thing, intubate. But before intubating, assess the child in the burn for the expected amount of edema and therefore the amount of distress to expect. Is it a large burn, so there will be a large amount of edema? Was the fire inside, so the patient is likely to have a smoke inhalation versus outside, where a smoke inhalation is less likely to occur? Also, is it a facial burn only, where edema will less likely to be as dramatic? If the child does need to be intubated, elective intubation is preferred to an emergent one and should always be done by someone experienced in managing a child's airway due to anatomical differences between the child and the adult. The child's larynx and glottis is more anterior, and the glottis is more angulated than in the adult. In determining the size of the endotracheal tube to use, you may use the formula 16 plus the age in years divided by four, or the diameter of the child's nares. Tape will not always stick to a burned surface, so to stabilize the tube, you may wrap 
cloth, or tool tape around the head. But be careful to monitor the amount of edema that is developing in the head so that the tape does not become tourniquet-like. During this time, you also want to insert an NG tube and elevate the head of the bed to help minimize the edema developing. After airway and breathing, your next concern is the child's circulation. Obtaining IV access is paramount after establishing the airway to begin fluid resuscitation. A large bore catheter, or two if anticipating large volumes of fluid, should be inserted. Femoral, internal jugular, or subclavian lines are appropriate, as are intraosseous infusions if necessary. In the field during the primary survey and before the total body surface area burned is determined, the guidelines for fluids are for a child five years of age and younger, he should receive 125 milliliters of lactated ringers per hour. The child six to 14 years of age should receive 250 milliliters of ringers per hour, and a child over 14 years of age should receive 500 milliliters of lactated ringers per hour. After circulation is disability or the child's level of consciousness. No matter the size of a burn, a patient should always be conscious. A burn alone does not cause a decreased level of consciousness. Therefore, if the child is unconscious, confused, or agitated, you should look for a cause other than the burn, such as hypoxia, hypoglycemia, a head injury, exaggerated pain levels, or other traumatic injuries. Last but not least is exposure. The burning process needs to be stopped if it's not already done. Then a head-to-toe assessment should be carried out, strip and flip the child to determine the full extent of his burn injury, being especially careful also of his temperature. During transfer and treatment, conserve body heat using blankets. Due to the large surface area of the head of a young child or baby, the head should also be covered. Room temperatures for care may need to be set at 80 degrees or higher as able. After your primary assessment, you are typically at a treating facility and begin the secondary assessment. During this time, you will be collecting information using the acronym AMPLET. You'll be determining the size of the burn, calculating fluid requirements, evaluating the effectiveness of the fluid resuscitation, and managing the child's pain. Using AMPLET, you will collect information about any of the child's allergies that he has, any medications that he's been on, his past medical history, including the circumstances of the trauma, his exposure to any communicable diseases, and a history of respiratory or developmental issues. You'll ask about his last meal, the events leading up to his current status, and also the status of his tetanus and other immunizations. Along with AMPLET, you will also need to calculate the extent of the child's burn. The most accurate tool to use for this determination is the Lund-Broder chart, which takes into account the proportional differences of a child versus an adult, is more accurate in determining the percentage of the body burned at different ages. This chart should be used in patients under 15 years of age. The Palmer method is where the palm and fingers represent 1% of the total body surface area burn and is useful in estimating the extent of irregularly scattered small burns. The Lundbroder chart is broken into three age groups, 1 to 4, 5 to 9, and 10 to 14. The body is also broken down into smaller areas and is more easily and accurately calculating the total body surface area burned. The head and legs are the body surface areas that change proportionately with age. Once a child is older than 14, the adult rule of nine tool can typically be used to determine the total body surface area burned. In the Palmer method, the child's palm and fingers are equal to 1% of his total body surface area. This method is helpful when the burns are small and scattered irregularly. This slide is a sample of the calculation of a total body surface area burn. A three-year-old reached up and pulled a pan of boiling water onto herself. Her burns are anterior to her body as follows. is on the lower half of her face, which equals 4%, on her neck, which is 1%, two-thirds of her chest, which equals 8%, her upper right arm circumferentially, which is 4%, and 
and she also has five scattered burns on her lower right arm and on her leg. And using the Palmer method, this gives 5%. Therefore, in this child, the total bur burn surface area is 22%. Fluid resuscitation is one of the most important aspects of treating a burn patient. The goal of fluid replacement is to maintain vital organ functioning while avoiding the complications of inadequate or excessive fluids. One thing that happens consistently in all burns in all age groups is the development of edema. Whether it is a, the small blister that develops after touching a hot oven or the massive edema seen with a large total body surface area burn it is the same process taking place. When you have tissue damage with a burn, two things happen. An inflammatory process begins and then there, there is an increase in capillary permeability. Together these cause leakage of water, electrolytes, and albumin molecules in the interstitial space, edema, which we call burn shock. The blood components left, the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and the large proteins result in poor perfusion of the vital organs. So fluid has to be replaced to prevent organ damage and failure. So who should receive fluid resuscitation? The indications for fluid resuscitation are for children who have greater than a 10% burn, a child under two years of age with any size burn, and for children who have pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes, cardiac disease, or pulmonary problems. Also, resuscitation is based on the percentage of second and third degree burns only. To start fluid re replacement, you insert two large bore IV catheters or one if giving a smaller amount of fluid. Hang an isotonic solution, and Ringer's lactate is the fluid of choice by most healthcare providers. Infants under 10 milligrams should receive D5 and lactated Ringer's, and the maintenance fluids given will also be D5 and lactated Ringer's. It is important to begin fluids as soon as possible. Once the child reaches the treating hospital, the modified Parkland formula should be used to replace fluids. Research has shown that children often require more fluids for burn shock resuscitation than do adults. The modified Parkland formula is the classic Parkland formula plus maintenance fluids. The Parkland formula, three milliliters times their weight in kilograms times their percent burn plus maintenance fluid are the amount of are the milliliters necessary for the first 24 hours from the time of the burn. This slide shows the formula for calculation of the maintenance fluids per hour. This formula is for maintenance fluids needed during the first 24 hours after the burn. Maintenance fluids for these first 24 hours described in the previous slide are calculated according to the formula 4 milliliters per kilogram for the first 10 kilograms of the child's weight plus 2 milliliters per kilogram for kilograms 11 through 20 of the child's weight, plus 1 milliliter per kilogram for each kilogram above 20. This will then equal the amount per hour to be added to the Parkland formula amount per hour. Once the total fluids for the first 24 hours are calculated, they are then given as 50% for the first 8 hours from the time of the burn not when the fluids were first started. Therefore, it is important to collect the information as to how much fluid was given on the trip from the site to the hospital. The second eight hours of fluids are given as a 25% of the total amount calculated, and the third eight hours are also 25% of the total amount calculated. The next two slides show an example of fluid resuscitation calculations. In this example, our four-year-old patient weighs 25 kilograms and has a 30% total body surface area burn. Using the Parkland formula is 3 milliliters times 25 kilograms times 30% burn equals 2,250 milliliters. The first eight hours, the child will receive 1,125 milliliters or 
140 milliliters per hour. During the second eight hours, he will receive 562 milliliters or 70 milliliters an hour. And during the third eight hours, he will again receive 562 milliliters or 72 milliliters per hour. The maintenance fluids for this child will be reflected in the following four milliliters times 10 kilograms plus two milliliters times 10 kilograms plus one milliliter times five kilograms, which will equal 65 milliliters per hour. So the total fluids for this child for the first 24 hours will be, for the first eight hours, 140 milliliters of the Parkland formula plus 65 of the maintenance formula for a total of 205 milliliters per hour. The second eight hours will equal 70 plus 65 equaling 135 milliliters an hour. And the third eight hours will be the same, 70 milliliters plus 65 equaling 135 milliliters per hour. There are certain types of burn injuries where increased fluids will be needed. Inhalation injuries accompanying the thermal trauma increase the magnitude of the total body injury and require more fluid and sodium to achieve resuscitation from early burn shock. An inhalation injury increases the fluid requirements for resuscitation from burn shock after a thermal injury. Therefore, the fluids are typically increased to four milliliters times the weight in kilograms times the percent burn. Electrical injuries typically require additional fluid, especially when there is a risk of myoglobin being present in the urine. Evaporative losses should be considered with large burns so that fluid requirements may also be higher. So how do you know that all of this is working? Urine output is the answer. If the kidneys are perfused well enough to create a prescribed amount of urine, you know that the rest of the body organs are being perfused. So insert a Foley catheter, assess the child's output, and then titrate the fluids to maintain urine output as follows. A child under 40 milligrams should put out one milliliter per kilogram per hour. The child over 40 kilograms should put out 1.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. For an electrical injury with a risk of myoglobinuria, the urine output should be higher. When the pediatric patient, you need 1.5 to 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So if you do not have enough urine output per the formula, what do you do next? Fluid shift and edema development cannot be stopped. It is part of the burn process. If the urine output is less than the prescribed amount for two consecutive hours, you need to increase the total fluids by one third. You do not want to use bolus therapy as this can lead to over resuscitation. Likewise, you do not want to give diuretics as this will give a false picture of the child's true fluid status. If the child has excessive urine output and the output is greater than the prescribed amount for two consecutive hours, then the fluid amount should be decreased by one-third. Another important aspect of burn care is pain management. With the numerous advances in burn care, many seriously injured patients will survive their injury, thus making adequate pain management throughout all phases of care paramount for successful physical and psychological recovery. Children who are in pain will typically cry, scream, bite, kick, try to escape, throw up, spit, punch you, curse at you, and also have changes in their heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and oxygen saturations. Children who are not in pain will be relaxed and will suck their thumb, sleep deeply, play, cooperate, and laugh. There are multiple factors which may influence a pediatric burn patient's pain. For example, anticipatory fear of what will happen when you come into the room. A child who has had prior hospitalizations and experienced pain may be more fearful. The presence and absence of parents can also affect a child's pain, as will traumatic experiences of the burn injury, such as if it was caused by abuse, if there was death of a loved one or even death of a beloved pet. Stranger anxiety will also affect pain, but this is also normal toddler behavior. 
There are several scales that may be used to determine a child's level of pain. The face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability scale, or the FLAC scale, is a measurement used to assess pain for children between the ages of two months and seven years, or individuals who are unable to communicate their pain. The scale is scored in a range of zero to 10, with zero representing no pain. The scale has five criteria, each which are each assigned a score of zero, one, or two. This slide shows the five criteria, facial expression, leg movement, activity level, amount of crying, and consolability, as well as the scoring for each criterion. The Wong-Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale is designed for children ages three and older. It offers a visual description for those who don't have the verbal skills to explain how their symptoms make them feel. To use this scale, you should explain that each face shows how a person in pain is feeling. The patient chooses the face that best fits how they feel. For the older child, a numerical pain scale allows the child to describe the intensity of his discomfort in numbers ranging from zero, indicating no pain, to 10, the worst possible pain. Numerical scales may also include words or descriptions to better label their symptoms, from feeling no pain to experiencing excruciating pain. Some researchers believe that this type of combination scale may be most sensitive to gender and ethnic differences in describing pain. Burn pain can best be treated using both non-pharmacological interventions as well as drugs. Examples of non-pharmacological interventions include distraction in music, such as those on DVDs, giving the child choices when able, thus giving the child some measure of control over what's happening to him, using short lead up time and announcing a procedure, rather than telling a small child that he has an hour until his procedure and then he's very nervous up to that point of time. Also being honest with the child will help develop a trusting relationship. Telling a child that it won't hurt when it will will destroy any credibility that you have in developing any kind of a trusting relationship with this child. Also, maintaining a calm environment when possible will help the child with his pain. Other non-pharmacological interventions include use of blankets and other comfort items, such as the child's pacifier or a favorite toy, use of guided imagery, avoiding overstimulation, massage, and parent involvement. When considering the use of drugs, remember that patients with burns, especially fresh burns, should not have to demonstrate their tolerance for pain. They should have scheduled pain meds. Wound pain has been described as excruciating. Morphine sulfate IV should be used during both the transport and throughout the acute admission. The typical dose is 0.1 milligram per kilogram per dose, but will vary greatly and must be titrated with considerations for the airway compromise and sensitivity. After morphine is discontinued, the child should be transitioned to hydrocodone, APAP, oxycodone, or oxycodone APAP, with a dose of 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram every four hours and PRN for all three drugs. Tylenol with codeine should not be used in children as deaths have been associated with cases where a child is a slow metabolizer of the codeine. Any child under two years of age or with a history of respiratory or sleep apnea issues should be placed on a monitor if receiving narcotics. Analgesics can be supplemented with short-acting benzodiazepines like Versed to enhance sedation and reduce anxiety. Adequate nutrition is paramount to wound healing. Children with burns are in a hypermetabolic state, which increases their core body temperature and slows wound healing and prolongs generalized weakness. Children with less than a 20% burn should be placed on a high protein, high calorie diet. For those with greater than a 20% burn, a flexible silastic feeding tube should be placed past the pylorus into the duodenum or jejunum. Children will tolerate enteral feeds as early as one to two hours post-burn. These feedings will preserve gut mucosal integrity and improve intestinal blood flow and motility. 
it is advisable to consult with a dietitian if available on both the volume and the formula for children being conscious of the likelihood of diarrhea if the child is fed too aggressively. Remember to start low and go slowly on any increases. If commercial formulas are needed, remember that tube feeding formulas are hyperosmolar, so if used, should be dilated by half to three-fourths to prevent diarrhea. Research has shown that enteral feeds are better choice for feeding burn patients than total parenteral nutrition. So in summary, for your primary assessment, airway and breathing, the child will show signs of respiratory distress faster than adult. Also, be alert to signs of inhalation injuries. Circulation in the field, start fluids, lactated ringers as soon as possible with prescribed amounts for the age group. Disability is similar to the adult. Exposure, maintaining temperature is an early priority. Calculate the total body surface area using the Lund-Broder chart. Fluid resuscitate using the modified Parkland formula. Manage pain with both pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods. In early nutrition, give high carbs, high protein, using enteral feeds as needed. Caring for children with burns requires a knowledge of their unique physical and developmental needs. Consult your burn coordinating center hotline with questions and concerns.